Good morning. The first item of business is general questions. And at question number one, I call Jackie Dunbar. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the work that it is doing to support elected <coughs> excuse me, representatives to take parental leave. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. Thank the member for her question. The Scottish Government remains committed to increasing the diversity of councillors in local government and breaking down barriers which currently discourage people from standing uh, or restanding from, for elected office. I support the introduction of proxy voting for councillors and the Scottish Government has been working in partnership with COSLA to look at how this could uh, enable elected representatives in local authorities to take parental leave without risking their democratic mandate in local authorities. Jackie Dunbar. I thank the Minister for his answer. And I am aware that he's previously suggested the use of Section 43 to enable proxy voting may be an option. However, it has also been suggested it may open a local authority up to legal challenge, either directly or as a means to challenge decisions where a proxy vote is the difference. So can I ask the Minister whether the Scottish Government could offer any support to help protect local authorities utilising Section 43 to enable proxy voting <coughs> excuse me, from the risks associated with such a challenge? Minister. Thank you. As, as I said, the Scottish Government is supportive of proxy voting for our, our local uh, councillors, but given the variations in approach to council meetings across Scotland, it is for individual local authorities to satisfy themselves that any pilot um, is within um, their existing powers. Um, while I want to be as helpful as I can, only the courts can authoritatively interpret the Scottish Parliament's legislation. However, in the interests of partnership working and in line with our commitment to increasing the diversity of councillors in elected office, I am meeting with Aberdeen City Council and COSLA next week to identify how we might be able to better support the local authority to run a pilot proxy voting scheme. Thank you. Question number two, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it plans to spend the £295 million in Barnet consequential funding arising from the UK Government's 2002 spring budget. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. Of the consequentials confirmed as part of the UK Government's spring budget, £237 million was derived from health spending. This will be passed on in full to health spending in Scotland. This is £235 million less than the in-year consequentials from health in 2023-24, which unfortunately were not baselined, even though they largely related to pay. These consequentials also include £48 million arising from local authority spending in England, announced in January, which will also be passed on in full to local government as part of a package of additional funding worth up to £62.7 million. I will provide a further update on the 2024-25 Scottish Budget next month, with formal allocation of any new funding to be included in the 2024-25 Autumn Budget Revision. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary and Deputy First Minister for the response. The SNP Government consistently likes to mislead the public about the amount of funding it receives from the UK Government, but the facts speak for themselves. In 2024-25, the Scottish Government will get £43 billion in a block grant and would receive more than £2,000 per person for public services. Yet this advantage has been completely squandered by the SNP Government, who have to raise taxes on hard-working Scots due to their wasteful spending. Therefore, Cabinet Secretary, do you really think spending money on independence papers while cutting NHS funding in real terms is the correct priority for this government? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, let's return to the matter of facts, uh, shall we? Uh, so fact number one is that the health spending that we have got in terms of the consequentials uh, leaves us with a shortfall for our health service, uh, given uh, that it is nearly half of what the health consequentials were for uh, last 23-24. Uh, Fact number two is that the lack of capital funding included in the spring statement means that there is a forecast £1.3 billion pounds at real terms cut in our capital funding over five years. So that means really that whether it's housing or health infrastructure or transport, I think that any Tory MSP coming here demanding any funding for any infrastructure projects 
should be looking at the UK Government's decision to cut our capital budget by that £1.3 billion over the next five years. I hope that's enough facts for Alexander Stewart. Keith Brown. I wonder if the uh, Cap sorry, Deputy First Minister would agree with me that it's also a fact of whether it's a Labour or Conservative Government, we've got five years more at least of austerity. And it's also a fact that the IFS has outlined that the UK Government spending plans amount to a real terms cut to net public sector investment of £18 billion between 24 25 and 28 29. And can the DFM outlet, so the Deputy First Minister, outline what assessment has been made of how much this amounts to per person? And can she outline how an SNP Government would prioritise investment if it had the fiscal levers of other independent nations? Cabinet Secretary. Well, in, indeed, it is a shocking fact that the UK Government is planning a real-term spending cut, which in 2028-29 would amount to a cut of around £250 for every person in the UK. Of course, in Scotland, we are taking a different approach. We're demonstrating our priorities through a, a record £6.3 billion investment in Social Security and over £19.5 billion for health and social care in 2024-25, a real terms uplift of £316 million in the face of UK government austerity. We could of course go, go much further if we had the full range of fiscal powers that other independent European nations have. Question number three, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the Audit Scotland report decarbonising heat in homes and the recent report by the Regulatory Review Group regarding the forthcoming Heat and Buildings Bill, what action is taking to further assess and develop the supply chain for decarbonising buildings? Minister Patrick Harvey. Both reports highlight the importance of long-term policy certainty for developing the supply chain. Our proposals for a Heat and Buildings Bill will create a clear long-term legislative framework, giving confidence to the supply chain and enabling investment in its growth. This approach was welcomed by stakeholders when I hosted a recent uh, roundtable discussion for members of the industry. Along with our enterprise agencies, we continue to provide support to innovate and accelerate skills and capacity. And this includes uh, the funding, the development and, adaptation, uh, development and adoption of innovative clean heating solutions, as well as considering new approaches that are needed to develop supply capacity. Brian Whittle. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? But over the past few months, I have submitted many written questions to the Minister on such topics like how many businesses are operating within the Zero Carbon Heating Centre, how many heat loss surveyors are working in Scotland and what economic modelling has been undertaken to understand the future demand on the supply chain. Can the Minister tell me how he intends to deliver on this bill, as he said urgently, if by his own admission in answering these questions, the Government is not gathering this basic data? If you're beginning a journey, Minister, it's not enough to know where you're going. Surely you need to know where you're starting from. Always through the Chair, Minister. We are indeed uh, very clear where we're starting from. This Government is under no illusions that Scotland and the UK would be in a far, far better position uh, not only to decarbonise our heating but to ensure affordable heating for people. If the, throughout Scotland and the UK decisions had been made decades earlier as the most progressive European countries did in responding, for example, to the energy crisis of the 1970s. Scotland should have been building highly energy efficient homes, uh, the ability to decarbonise for decades. Those, mis those long-standing mistakes of successive UK governments are the reason we have an incredible challenge now. But what this government is doing is giving the long-term certainty that will enable investment in this industry a far cry from what the UK Government is doing of watering down, diluting and delaying action uh, on heat in buildings just this month indeed. They delayed the clean heat market mechanism for an entire year, sending exactly the wrong signals to industry about the need to scale up, skill up and invest. Absolutely. Ivan McKee. Yeah. Uh, can I ask the uh, Government whether it is continuing its work on its supply chain development programme, which focuses on building Scottish manufacturing capability to supply products needed for the net zero transition, and which learns the lessons from our success in rapidly building Scottish PPE supply chains during the pandemic? Minister. Uh, yes, indeed, the, the supply chain development programme does continue its work to align uh, economy and, and innovation policy interventions with public sector spend, uh, including 
uh, both more, uh, using more strategically uh, important approaches to improve the capacity uh, and capability of Scottish manufacturing supply chains. Prioritising the opportunities in low carbon heating and housing uh, means that we're working to make sure that procurement opportunities are made visible in the Scottish supply chain, including with manufacturers. And there's also a huge amount of innovation happening in Scotland to develop the products, processes and services that will enable us to meet this challenge domestically, but will also offer uh, export opportunities. Willie Rennie. Late last year, I attended the Energy Efficiency Association conference, an important part of the, that supply chain, they identified extensive delays in the awarding of grants from Home Energy Scotland, and they said that this was having an impact on their capacity and therefore the supply chain. So what improvements is the Minister making to the operation of Home Energy Scotland so we can get those grants out much quicker so customers don't cancel their orders and so we can get on to meeting those targets? Minister. Thank you. We, we do have a good track record through Home Energy Scotland of meeting the targets for, for grants. Uh, some suppliers choose to count the entire customer journey from uh, application uh, rather than the, uh, the, the uh, award of grants from the, the point where uh, an application has been accepted and processed. That is a bit longer than the uh, UK government's boiler upgrade scheme, for example, which doesn't include the direct uh, individual bespoke advice and support that Home Energy Scotland provides. So we provide more and that whole customer journey takes a little bit longer. But we have recently improved the uh, Home Energy Scotland uh, application process to further improve uh, the, uh, the, the, the time that it takes uh, and the, the smoothness of the, the customer journey. Mark Cruskell. The Minister has just mentioned that the UK Government has delayed its clean heat market mechanism, a scheme which uses reserve powers to regulate the industry to increase the installations we desperately need. This delay came after months of briefing and counter-briefing on whether the scheme was to be scrapped altogether. The Minister has just highlighted the need for certainty and clarity in regulation. Does he feel that the UK Government is really providing that? Minister. Mark Rubs Ruskell is absolutely right to point this out. The clean heat market mechanism uh, was a mechanism brought forward by the UK government. We supported it. We said it would help uh, not only to achieve their targets, but help us to achieve our, our targets with the potential to shape the growing market for clean heating systems. And it uses powers that are reserved to the UK government that we cannot use here. So the delay after months of speculation and lobbying by vested interests who wanted to kill that scheme off, the delay is hugely disappointing and it will discourage existing boiler manufacturers uh, from increasing their investment in their ability to supply clean heating systems. Uh, so I would encourage the Prime Minister to drop his culture war on climate that launched last autumn and give long-term certainty that the industry needs. Question number four, James Dornan. The latest report by the Royal Bank of Scotland and private sector activity which showed that employment growth in Scotland was faster than any other UK nation or region. Cabinet Secretary, I'm assuming you've picked up enough of the question. I did, Presiding Officer, and I have a note of <coughs> the first question in writing. Um, I welcome this data which has shown that uh, employment growth is faster in Scotland than in other parts of the UK. Uh, the Scottish Government is using all the powers at our disposal to grow a fair and green wellbeing economy. Uh, but the fact remains that Scotland uh, is tied to a UK economic model with stagnating productivity and lessening living standards and is also facing a number of self-imposed challenges, uh, chief among them Brexit and of course self-defeating migration policies alongside. Um, we are continuing to pay the price for Westminster mismanagement and uh, indeed for Westminster uh, austerity. Independence, presiding officer, is the route to higher living standards, yep. better public services and a stronger, fairer economy. James Dornan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that uh, reply, uh, and I'm sure she agrees with me that, well, it's great to see the positive reports about Scotland's economy. We would be better as that independent country, part of the EU, rather than this post-Brexit failed state that is the United Kingdom. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, I do absolutely agree with that. The UK government's uh, reckless decision to take Scotland out of the EU single market against Scotland's democratic will is damaging uh, Scottish trade and the economy. 
Indeed, modelling uh, by the National Institute of Economic and Social Research shows the UK economy is now 2.5% smaller than it would have been in the EU, a gap which could increase to 5.7% by 2035. That is before, presiding officer, we even touch on what we have lost socially and how far the, uh, the UK has fallen in terms of its international uh, standing. Scotland's future should be as an independent country back in the EU so that we can emulate the success of our comparator countries and seize that future prosperity which this government uh, is in no doubt awaits Scotland. Myrtle Fraser. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Although the growth in employment in the latest figures is very welcome, the Cabinet Secretary will know that the employment rate in Scotland still lags behind the UK as a whole. Indeed, the latest uh, CBI Fraser of Allender Productivity Index showed Scotland lagging uh, the rest of the UK in 10 out of 13 productivity indicators, including business investment, exports and R&D investment. Instead of moaning about the position in the UK, can the Cabinet Secretary explain why Scotland lags behind other parts of the UK and what is she going to do to turn the situation around? Cabinet Secretary. Um, Presiding Officer, Murdo Fraser comes to lecture me at a time when uh, the UK has recently fallen into a technical recession and indeed after his party has, for half of, my adult, uh, half of my life, all of my adult life, overseen 15 years of austerity, yeah. a self-imposed Brexit pursued uh, during a, a pandemic, tax cuts over public services and ultimately living standards plummeting, so that we now have a UK which analysis in the Financial Times is described as a poor country with pockets of rich people. I will take no lectures from Murdo Fraser or the Tories. Thank you. Questions number five and number six have been withdrawn and at question number seven I call Kate Forbes. To ask the Scottish Government how it ensures that the voices of Highland communities are appropriately considered by the Energy Consent Unit when assessing applications from developers. Minister Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. It is vital that everyone has the opportunity to engage in decisions about future developments. We are clear that this engagement must begin as early as possible by developers at the pre-application stage. It should be effective, collaborative and meaningful in order to truly influence the final application. Once a Section 36 or 37 application has been submitted to the Energy Consents Unit, members of the general public or groups may make direct representations and comment to Scottish Ministers. Scottish Ministers take these views into account alongside all other application documentation in making their decision. Kate Forbes. The Minister may be aware that the Highland Council has objected to SSEN's application for the Sky Overhead Line reinforcement. What is the Minister's response to the firm belief of campaigners that as a result Schedule 8 of the Electricity Act 1989 requires a public local inquiry and that in view of the overwhelming interest and response on the Isle of Skye, the Energy Consents Unit should send the application for a public local inquiry? Minister. The Sky Reinforcement Project is currently the subject of a live application under th Section 37 of the Electricity Act 1989. And Ms Forbes will know that in my uh, role as Energy Minister, I am unable to comment on how such applications are being or may be considered, as this could be viewed as prejudicial to the decision-making process. Thank you. Question number eight, Paul O'Kane to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the implementation of the immediate priorities plan developed with disabled people's organisations. Minister Emma Roddick. The Scottish Government is working hard to improve the lives of disabled people. The Independent Living Fund, which supports disabled people, will reopen to new applicants after receiving a £9 million investment as part of the 2024-25 Scottish Budget and will support around 1,000 new applicants. Later this year, we will implement an immediate priorities plan that will deliver a range of actions to support disabled people. In addition, £5 million from our Equality and Human Rights Fund supports disabled people's organisations to tackle inequality and discrimination, furthering equality and advancing the realisation of human rights in Scotland. Paul O'Kane. 
Disabled people across uh, my West Scotland region have been in touch uh, with me to express their frustration at a government that they feel is not taking the issues and concerns of disabled people seriously. Whilst they have welcomed the intent behind the immediate priorities plan, it has become something of a misnomer because there is no immediacy on something that you have been discussing for a year and we've seen very little progress and indeed the Minister's answer there suggests later this year sometime we'll see further progress. So will she listen to the concerns of disabled people who are raising these issues with their MSPs and what is she going to do to energise this work as a matter of urgency so that we can deliver on the action for the challenges facing disabled people in Scotland? Minister. The member will appreciate that this is a plan that is being co-produced with disabled people's organisations. And on Tuesday this week, I met with those disabled people's organisations, along with the First Minister and the Cabinet Secretary, to ensure that we are moving forward as quickly as we can with publishing and then implementing the plan. I do want to point out that this is not the only piece of work that we are undertaking to support disabled people. Indeed, I covered a few in my initial answer, but I'd be more than happy to share even more of what the Scottish Government is doing with the member if he is interested. Thank you.